Thank you so much for participating this morning. Thank you for uh, University Mennonite Church's ongoing Zoom worship. Thank you for sending in your pictures and videos of the ways that you have been living your weeks during this uh, ongoing quarantine pandemic season. Um, we're thankful that Jim Rosenberger is our video sharing person this morning. And whenever you're ready, Jim, you can start our worship time together by sharing that prelude video. Good morning, brothers and sisters. Glad to be with you this morning. As we continue to listen to a multitude of voices this morning, we welcome Dave Mishler, Allegheny Conference Minister, who will be bringing our message. His sermon title this morning is Restoring the Divine Center, a theme from Richard Rohr, who asks, what do you allow your center to be on a day-to-day -day basis. And so as we lean into the work of this challenging time, returning to our divine center as the place where we find the strength 
and the courage and the fortitude to remain grounded in Christ. I invite you to hear these words from Psalm 23, a slightly different version by Nan Merrill. So receive these words as our call to worship. Oh, my beloved, you are my shepherd. I shall not want. You bring me to green pastures for rest and lead me beside still waters, renewing my spirit. You restore my soul. You lead me in the path of goodness to follow love's way. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I am not afraid, for you are ever with me. Your rod and your staff, they guide me. They give me strength and comfort. You prepare a table before me in the presence of all my fears. You bless me with oil. My cup overflows. Surely goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the heart of the beloved forever. Amen. This week, as we light the peace lamp, we spe especially I want to remember that the Nobel Peace Prize was awarded this week to the World Food Program for its efforts to combat hunger. And in combating hunger, they are working towards bringing peace in conflicted areas where sometimes hunger is used as a weapon of war and conflict. Back in 2019, 135 million people across our globe suffered from acute hunger, the highest number in many years. And so we light the candle today, praying for peace, a peace that we can actively be a part of. Pray with me. O oh Lord, as we light this lamp, may it remind us to join you, to join you in this work of peace, whether it is spreading love, whether it is helping to combat hunger, whether it is remembering the indigenous peoples around the world and offering respect. Lord, you call us to be peacemakers, to do that work in this world. May it be so. Amen. And as we move into our time of offering, I offer this prayer. God of abundant love, may we open our hearts, our minds, and our lives, sharing our resources of time, talents, and finances to further your kingdom on earth. Amen. Jesus before me, Jesus beside me.
We're moving into children's time, so kids, I invite you to come and make sure you're watching. I wanted to let you know that Lily and I, Lily is going to be bringing our children's time in just a minute. And she and I met recently, um, wondering if there was a way to get you guys, especially the kids, involved in this project for the next couple of weeks. You might save your pennies or your quarters or your nickels as a way of helping with this task of ending hunger. So no matter who we are, we can do this work of peace. So let's see what Lily brings to us this morning. Hi everyone. As you know, each year our church participates in Crop Hunger Walk. Crop Hunger Walks are fundraisers organized by churches, businesses, schools, and other organizations in the United States. The goal is to raise money to help people in the U.S. and around the world who can't afford enough food for themselves and their families. This video will show you some ways that crop walk money helps people. So here is the video that uh, is on our church's homepage, which you will receive the link to soon. And this is one of the inspirations that we had for what we built our website off of. I hope you enjoy. servicio me ha dado un apoyo siempre me ha apoyado en los problemas míos difíciles y me siento bien con el servicio antes mucho antes mucho mucho porque cuando él me trajeron la puerquita y me dijo a mí y tú vas a coger esa cosita así digo yo déjame la así que yo la crío y la llevo a, ahí como quitándome los ánimos yo dije no no tengo que estar aquí en el campo pero tengo que estar haciendo algo Tengo que manejar mi chelito. Ocho, nueve, hay como once, once embarazadas. Eh, esto que tiene la señora, aquí no hay tanto, porque como el, como el trabajo de los cerdos es eh, paulatino, es eh, al paso, no hay tanto que esté iniciándose. Pero si se da la educación y se le enseña cómo ellos producir, lo van a hacer. Una familia con, con una granjita de cerdo, pueden tener una casa. Mira, yo al principio no tenía, por lo menos, pero me donaron esa y cuánto dinerito no me he entrado a mí, que le agradezco mucho eso. Cuando las personas no, no le interesa que nadie les regale un peso. Son familias trabajadoras, Cuando se educan para hacer un trabajo, lo hacen y ya ustedes pueden ver cómo está esa granja. Yo le diría que pueden donarla a confianza para esta comunidad, porque aquí ya vemos muchas personas que trabajamos. Que es como yo le digo, que no es que le den a uno, sino que enseñen a uno a trabajar. So, although we don't exactly know where CropWalk will use our money, we know that the money will go to support our local food bank and state college and families in need around the world. We are participating in CropWalk again this year, and if you think you might donate, consider how much money is needed to accomplish some of CropWalk's goals. For instance, they estimate it costs about $20 for 200 baby fish as a healthy, reliable food source, and $120 for the pond to keep the fish. It also costs about $60 to provide a starter pig to a family and around $950 for enough seedlings to start two community nurseries. We would like to buy as many piglets, fish, fish ponds, and seedlings as we can to help families become more food secure. In past years, our church has met and walked together in downtown State College with other churches and organizations, just like people all around the country. This year, because it is not exactly safe in many places in the country, CROP is encouraging people to just go outside and walk in general. 
There is a map on their page of the course different groups usually take around the country, and you can walk those as well if you want. You do not need to walk to donate. Our church has a page where you can donate, and we will send that link via email soon. I hope you'll consider donating. I'll now be reading Philippians chapter 4, verses 1 through 9. Therefore, my brothers and sisters, whom I love and long for, my joy and crown, stand firm in the Lord in this way, my beloved. I urge Yodia and I urge Syntyche to be of the same mind in the Lord. Yes, and I ask you also, my loyal companion, help these women, for they have struggled beside me in the work of the gospel, together with Clement and the rest of my co-workers, whose names are in the book of life. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say, rejoice. Let your gentleness be known to everyone. The Lord is near. Do not worry about anything, but in everything, by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Finally, beloved, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is pleasing, whatever is commendable, if there is any excellence and if there is anything worthy of praise, think about these things. Keep on doing the things that you have learned and received and heard and seen in me, and the God of peace will be with you. Greetings from Allegheny Mennonite Conference, where I serve as your conference minister, and from Scottsdale Mennonite Church, where I serve them as their pastor, a sister congregation of yours. I'm happy to be with you this morning and to present to you a message from Philippians chapter 4. If there ever was a time of mixed feelings, mixed messages, mixed priorities, Mixed agendas, we live in such times. For the last seven months, I've been riding along with all of us a whirlwind of feelings and conflicted messages, priorities, and agendas. And yet these times have also ushered in new opportunities, new possibilities, new directions. What we allow to be our center has determined and will determine how we're able to navigate the whirlwind what we allow to be our center. I chose to follow the lectionary scriptures today, the uh, Re Revised Common Lectionary, partly because one of your 13 scriptures, I smiled when I found out that you couldn't limit your search to 12, is contained in the Common Lectionary readings for today, Philippians 4, 1 to 9. If there ever was a scripture text that was clear about centering ourselves, this is one of them. Think about these things. This text is not full of suggestions. There are seven imperatives in verses four to nine alone. This text tells us that if we follow these directives, the result will be the peace of God. And the text affirms and reaffirms this result. The peace of God will be with us. So no worries, right? Just think about truth, honor, justice, purity, whatever is pleasing, commendable, excellent, worthy of praise, and it's all good. End of story. Ah, yes, but there's the pandemic. There's a most contentious election. There's racism and injustices of all kinds rearing their ugly heads in ways that seem especially egregious. Surely such a simple solution, thinking about certain things, centering ourselves a certain way, cannot overcome the mountains of trouble we are facing. I found the title to this sermon, Restoring the Divine Center, in a September 19 Richard Rohr post. In that post, he contemplates three sources. First, the story of a Jewish woman who suffered much more injustice 
in the concentration camp than we are suffering now. Second, Psalm 62, which must have been written in a time of major oppression of the Jewish people. And third, the Irish poet W.B. Yeats, who wrote his second coming during the horrors of World War I and the Spanish flu pandemic. Although it's worth reviewing all three, I will quote only from Yeats' oft-mentioned poem. It feels like direct prophecy. See if you don't agree, says Rohr. Turning and turning in the widening gyre, the falcon cannot hear the falconer. Things fall apart. The center cannot hold. Mere anarchy is loosed upon the world. The blood-dimmed tide is loosed, and everywhere the ceremony of innocence is drowned. The best lack all conviction, while the worst are full of passionate intensity. Somehow our occupation and vocation as believers in this sad time must be to first restore the divine center by holding it and fully occupying it ourselves, says Rohr. He continues, if contemplation means anything, it means that we can within ourselves safeguard that little piece of you, God, as Eddie Hillisum describes it from the prison camp. What other power do we have now? All else is tearing us apart inside and out. No matter who wins the election or who is on the Supreme Court, we cannot abide in such a place for any length of time or it will become our prison." End quote. I find it amazing that today's other lectionary texts draw our attention to other centers, other centers which have never produced what they promised, worshiping an image of gold, Exodus 32, a litany of all the sins of God's chosen people, which uncentered them in Psalm 106, and turning down the invitation to God's banquet because of other centering priorities, Matthew 22. Indeed, living into the imperatives of Philippians 4 is no easy task, but it is the only thing that will give us peace in these times. What do you think about from day to day? What do you give your center to? Allow your center to be the folks at Scottsdale know my ambivalence about participating in the political enterprise of our nation. In some ways, I believe it's a fool's errand to trust a political process that exposes lying and posturing and so many dishonorable, unjust, and downright dirty practices from all sides. Very little worthy of praise to think about. For centuries, Anabaptists did not participate in the political enterprise precisely so they could render unbiased, or at least less biased, perspectives into the cultures and political frameworks in which they found themselves. I don't take a hard position, as some did in the past, to not participate in our particular electoral enterprise, but I caution us if we believe that any president will lead us to the promised land. God is neither Democrat nor Republican. God may run in the Green Party, but that's another story. I counsel us to lean into the imperatives of Philippians 4. Be gentle. Worry less. Pray. Supplicate. Give thanks. Think about these things whatever is true, honorable, pure, just, pleasing, commendable, excellent, worthy of praise. This is where and how we will restore the divine center. Think about these things. Give our hearts, time, and energy to these things. And the peace of God will be with us. And the peace of God will be with us. A study some years back said that, on average, Americans process 100,000 words or 34 gigabytes of information every day. 
listening, reading, talk shows, newscasts, blogs, all these have become part of our daily diet. What happens with all of this input? One writer says, my mind processes it and it becomes a part of me. Then when I write or speak, it comes out in my own words. That's the stuff of our text. What we center on becomes part of us, part of who we are, and it comes out of us. But the text doesn't end there. The final command is to keep doing. It's after this keep doing command that the promise of peace is reiterated. Peace comes not just by focusing in on the divine center, it comes by action. What we center around does indeed come out of us. I pray that what comes out of us reflects the ways and actions of Jesus. So let it be. Amen, amen, amen. We're going to move into a time of announcements now, but also a time of welcoming visitors. So if you're new with us this morning, we'd love to know who you are. If you would please unmute if you feel comfortable and simply tell us your name and where you're from. Good morning, this is Susan, and I would like to introduce my friend and visitor for the weekend. This is Audra Shank from Scottdale Mennonite Church. Then you would know of Audra through her son, Joel. Um, it's very nice to have Audra here for the weekend and um, we shared the same pastor in Dave Mishler for a while. <laughs> Thank you. Welcome, Audra. Thank you. Would anyone else like to introduce themselves this morning? I'm not sure if George is still on the screen. We had George and his wife, Jenny with us earlier. Mm, how about any birthdays or anniversaries to celebrate today, to celebrate this week? Um, Doug and I had um, birthdays yesterday. 
That's right. Doug and Vonda share the same birthday on the 10th. Happy birthday to you both. Anyone else with birthdays or anniversaries? Mm, well, can we all, even though we're muted, uh, send a gusty happy birthday to Doug and Vonda? <laughs> yes, happy birthday to you both. Thank you. <laughs> Doug is working today, so I'll send his greetings. Well, I want to remind you that right after the service, we will have about 10 minutes in breakout rooms as a way to just check in with one another and say hello. So please feel free to stay on for that. Uh, we are ending our service a little uncharacteristically early this morning. And so Dave Mishler, I'm wondering if it's okay with you if we might bump up our Sunday school start time and start Sunday school at 1045 this morning. Dave, are you able to weigh in on that? Sure, that works. I'm at your disposal this morning. Great. Well, why don't we, after service wraps up and we do our breakout rooms, then we'll come back at 1045 for everyone who'd like to be a part of our Sunday school discussion. Good. Well, as we bring this service to a close today, I have a benediction from another Franciscan monk, a benediction that is a call to action, a call to doing, as Dave mentioned, as being part of the process of finding peace in our lives. So my brothers and sisters, hear this benediction. It's a little bit long, but it is a prayer that I think we need to hear in this day and age. May God bless you with discomfort at easy answers, half-truths, and superficial relationships, so that you live rooted in the heart of God. May God bless you with anger at injustice, oppression, and exploitation, so that you work for justice, freedom, and peace. May God bless you with tears shed for those who suffer pain, rejection, hunger, and war, so that you reach out your hand to comfort. May God bless you with enough foolishness to believe that you can make a difference in this world, so that you can do what others claim cannot be done, bringing justice and kindness to all. And my brothers and sisters, siblings in Christ, may the blessing of God who creates, redeems, and sustains be upon you this day and forevermore. Amen. Go in peace.